glory. Open your eyes on my heart and join me singing number 92 in the songbook, Open Your Eyes on My Heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you I am lifted up, shining and lining in the light of your glory, for your power and love, as we sing holy, 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 open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, to see you I want to see you open, open the eyes of my heart Lord open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you to see you I am lifted up Shine, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. want to see, holy, holy. I want to see you. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice and join me singing number 76, Days of Elijah in the songbook. These are the days of Eliah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And the, these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword. Still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's the year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. the days and these are the days of ezekiel the dry bones becoming flesh and these are the days of your servant david rebuilding a temple of praise and these are the days of the harvest the fields are white in the world, and we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. 
Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Hang on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Please stand as we sing our opening hymn, the number 469, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, meaning the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, evening on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet is with this pilgrim way. Leaning, the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What a right to fear, leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, leaning to your as we sing Spirit of the Living God. Almighty Father, we fall before you today, knowing that you're not only our Father, but you're our Creator, our Redeemer, and our King. And we come asking for your Holy Spirit to be a part of this service. Touch our ears, our hearts, our lips, that when we leave this service, we will have been refreshed, and that our pledge of allegiance to you will be deepened. In your Son's name we pray, amen.
Now time for the children's story. Ch um, kids, please come and get the buckets so you can collect the offerings that go to our church school. Well, the world around me tells me that Superman's a superhero, right? And who are some of the others? I am tickled pink that they don't know. Wonder Man, somebody said Jesus, and that's right. And somebody said my mom, and that is correct. Superman, Wonder Woman, Hulk, all of these guys and gals are supposed to be superhuman. And they're supposed to be heroes, but you know, a hero to me is someone who gives of themselves to save the lives of others. And Jesus qualifies, and Mother qualifies, and several other comments that were made. But I want to talk to you about a man who is kind of extraordinary. I had a little brother that was born, and at five days he passed away. He was born with a congenital heart defect, and also with RH negative blood. Now, that doesn't mean much to some of you, but at that time it meant that there would be physical deformities and other things. But this man, James Harrison, when he was 14, was hospitalized. He had a lung removed at age 14. He was in the hospital for 90 days, 13 weeks. He had 13 pints of blood administered. Uh, Russell, is that a large amount? That's a large amount of blood to be given. It's, it's over two gallons. And I can't imagine going through this. But he stayed in that hospital, and as he was there, it became aware to him that his life was being sustained by the generosity of people like you folks, who when Red Cross is available, you go and see them and donate. And I did until I aged out. 
and uh, they don't want my blood no more. But I, I challenge you, if you're capable of giving blood to do it, James hated needles. Remember that as the story is told. When they take blood, they take a little needle and they poke it in your vein here and the blood flows out by gravity into a bag and then they do all kinds of things with it. It saves other people's lives. He was never able to look at the needle as it was being inserted. And I've been in the trailer when they inserted blood in other people's arms and I've watched people pass out and all kinds of fun things when it happens. But 10 years passed and in that 10 years, he was contacted by one of the doctors and said, you have a rare thing in your blood that can help a lot of people. Now, from the age of 18, when he was legally able to give blood without his parents' signature, he had gone in every, every quarter and given blood. So, from, for 10 years, he had done that. He'd given over 30 times and now they're telling him that he has a special kind of, of blood, and that blood would help RH negative people have a life like you folks would. When a person is attacked with this RH negative blood, they have things like anemia, deformities. They said that's what my little brother's problem was. And in the worst case, it leads to death like it did with my little brother. His blood, for some strange reason, had a, a special content in it that made it able to save the lives of these RH people. Over his lifetime, it's estimated that 2.5 million babies had their lives changed because of this one man's blood donation. 2.5 million. I want to tell you there's another man who did a blood transfusion. His name is Jesus. And I don't know how many million people he has saved. But I know that he loves you enough that he would have died just for you or you if you'd been the only people that would have ever accepted his love. That's how valuable you are. And when the world tells you that you're no good, that you're not worth anything, just remember Jesus says you were worth everything. He gave His life so that you could have eternity. Let's pray. Father, standing you seating here before us are our little people that are going to grow up and do amazing things for you. And we pray as a church that we might be an encouragement to them that we might be helpers in their Christian growth, and that they might always focus on that one who came to give his everything for them. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I had Lynn do some special work for me today, this last week, and I, I want to compliment you as a church. And David told you, yes, we're a little bit behind, but I want to tell you that we're just nip and tuck with what we did last year this time. Now, why is that amazing? It's amazing because we have about an 8.9% inflation rate. So in spite of that, you folks have dug deep and you have been able to give and keep us on track with where we were last year at this time. We need to do a little bit more. And I've pledged to do a little bit more. Barbara has pledged to do a little bit more. So sometimes as I was selling the Bible story, I would tell people it's like not buying that one cup of whatever you choose to drink or one glass of, or one candy bar, or one bag of chips. It's the little things that add up, and they can make a big difference. i got news for you. Our church school is growing. 
even now it's one student larger. We will not be able to handle in our present building the way it's configured the number of children that will want to be here next year. With the rules that the CDC and the government are passing on COVID vaccinations, I can see a lot of other parents coming and wanting their children outside of that public school system. You need to pray earnestly about what you can do, what you can give towards helping to build a new church school building. And when you do that, put that in your offering envelope and write on their church school project. And we'll put it in the budget that way so that we'll know how much money we have to operate on. As financial committee, we are held accountable for every penny that you put in that offering envelope to spend it the way you say it's to be spent. So, thank you for giving. And we'll ask the deacons and the ushers to come forward at this time. And I want to thank our deacons and ushers. Week after week they come, they turn the lights on, they, they set up the building so that we can worship. And they're an amazing group of men, and our deaconesses are just as amazing. Father God, we thank You for the money that You've given to us. Every penny that we earn is Yours. But You've told us, told us to go ahead and use 90% of it as we choose, to return You to the, the tithe, and we choose to do that. But on top of that, we're so grateful for what You've done that we want to give extra. So accept the offerings today as they are given. May they accomplish Your work, and may You come soon. In Your Son's name I pray. Amen. It is now time for our prayer worship. Um, out in the vestibule, there is a prayer journal out there. So if anybody needs to put their name or, or family member or church member or anybody that you would like to pray for, we have a prayer journal out there. Is there any unspoken requests this morning? All right. If everybody is all possible, let's kneel as we sing our cares course.
I cast all my care upon you. I lay all of my burdens down at my feet. And any time I don't know, know what to do, I will cast all my care upon you. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this day for our prayers. Lord, just be with the people's name that they have put in the prayer journal, Lord. Lord, be also be with the ones that have raised their hands for the unspoken request this morning. Just lay your hands upon them for whatever they need, Lord, whether it's financial, health, whatever, Lord. Just be with them, for it's in your Son's Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please turn to Deuteronomy 6, verse 1 and 2. These are the commands, rules, and laws of the Lord your God. He told the land you are crossing the Jordan River to own. Your children and grandchildren must respect the Lord your God. You must do this as long as you live. Obey all his rules and and command and commands I give you. Then you will live a long time. I really appreciate our young people participating in our service, uh, leading our song service, reading our scripture. Uh, it's wonderful. I remember as a child growing up outside of the church, going to public school, and from the time I was in kindergarten, we opened up every school time with a Pledge of Allegiance to the flag and with the Lord's Prayer. I never had been to church at that time, but I was learning the Lord's Prayer, and it was amazing to me that we made those changes in society since when the pledge is no longer looked at as something that we need to say and when the Lord's Prayer is something almost uh, demonic in some people's minds. Society has changed. I remember in 1957 going to a baptismal class. I'd already taken three Seventh-day Adventist Bible courses. Didn't know they were Seventh-day Adventists, but one came in the mail and I signed up for it and they kept coming and I learned a lot of things, and my father had been watching, although I didn't ever hear from him that he had been, and I never knew that he had been raised a Seventh-day Adventist, and I didn't know until later that at age 12, he ran away from home and left the church and left his family all behind. I remember going through a baptismal class with 20 people who had gone through an evangelistic crusade. I didn't learn anything new, really, but just little things added. And I want to tell you that if you've just gone through a baptismal class, there's no way that you know it all. So when you see an evangelistic service here at the church, you owe it to yourself, to your friends, neighbors, and family to be here as often as you can. It is by the repetition of hearing those things over and over again that they start making sense, that they line up in a way that you can tell other people, this is what the Bible says rather than having to say, well, you know, you ought to come to church and talk to my pastor. Or I'll have my pastor come. Uh, by the way, that means that you're here today not to hear me so much as you are to hear God. That means you were here this morning to listen to God, not your Sabbath school teacher. Your Sabbath school teacher is not responsible for your eternity. You are. It is your responsibility to take the Bible and open it up and read it. It is your responsibility as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian to open up the spirit of prophecy and read it and learn for yourself what it is that you believe, what it is that you pledged allegiance to when you went through that baptistry. We've been privileged the last several weeks to see two baptisms. We've been privileged to hear the pastor read the baptismal vows. 
But I think we hear them and we don't hear them. Does that make sense? We hear them, but we're not listening to them. And we have forgotten in many cases what it is that we really have pledged allegiance to. Sometimes I think we get used to seeing the Bible on the screen and we don't get to see it, get used to reading it in our laps. So I'm not going to use the screens. I want to hear your Bible pages turn. And yes, I enjoy the electronic Bibles and they're wonderful, but I can't mark things in them the way that I would in my personal Bible. In my personal Bible, I have 300 Bible studies marked. And I've had on the point of, I don't have a photographic memory like some people, but I've had to sit at a campfire and open up my Bible and do a chain reference through three or four subjects in a row. And it is that chain reference in my Bible that has helped me to get through those studies. I don't have it all memorized. I don't have all the answers. So this morning, I want you to turn to Luke 12. And I know that you're used to hearing it in the King James, and that's great. It's wonderfully written. It's one of the most poetic versions out there. I'm going to read it in a different version. I'm going to read it in the voice, and the voice is a translation paraphrase. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it's, it is a translation, not so much word for word as it is a thought translation. And the voice in Luke 12, starting in verse 22, says this, Then to his disciples, this is why I keep telling you not to worry about anything in life about what you will eat, about what you will put on your bodies. Life is more than your food, and your body is more than your fancy clothes. It doesn't make any difference what the label is in the back of that shirt or the back of that dress. To God, you are what's important. You are His jewel, not what you put on. Think about those crows flying over there. Do they plant or harvest crops? Do they own silos or barns? But watch them fly. Listen to them praise me. It looks like God is taking diligent care of them, doesn't it? Remember that you're more precious to God than many birds. Which one of you can add a single hour to your lifespan or 18 inches to your height by worrying hard? That doesn't mean much to you, but at 12, 14 years of age even, I was five foot tall. I wanted to be taller than my mother. My father was five nine. My mother was five foot, and I wanted to be taller than my mother. I ate like a horse. Uh, in a pie-eating contest, I ate a whole cherry pie for a Thanksgiving festival. I'm not bragging about that, I'm, but I'm saying that's how anxious I was to grow one inch so I could be taller than my mother. And I ended up growing 10 inches in one summer. That was not by my might nor by my strength, but it was by the God planted in my genes. If worry cannot change you, verse 26, why do you do it so often? Think about these beautiful wild lilies growing over here. They don't work up a sweat toiling for their needs or wants. They don't worry about what they're going to put on. Yet the great King Solomon never had an outfit that was half as glorious as theirs. Again, you are the jewel. You are the one God's taking to heaven. It is not what you put on your body that makes you worthwhile to God. That is society's lie. And we've swallowed it. They worry not about, the, yet the great King Solomon never had an outfit as glorious as theirs. Look at the grass growing over there. One day it thrives in the field, the next day it's as fuel. If God takes such diligent care of such transient things, how much more can he de you depend on him to take care of you? Oh, you weak in faith. Do not reduce your life to the pursuit of food and drink and clothing. Do not let your mind be filled with anxiety. People of the world who do not know God pursue these things, but you have a Father that cares for you. You have a Father that cares for you. That ought to bring exciting news, even if you've heard it. How many of you ever heard your father say, I'm proud of you? Did it make you feel good? Your father is proud of you. 
your heavenly father. No, if no earthly father has ever told you, that's, that's horrible. But your heavenly father is proud of you. Since you do not worry about security and safety, about your food and clothing, then pursue God's kingdom primarily. And these other things will come when you need them. That means you can sell your possessions, give generously to the poor. It's really interesting when I read the Old Testament prophets and they talk about Israel's sin, they talk about Sodom and Gomorrah's sin. Yes, they had a deviant sex lifestyle, but the biggest part was they didn't take care of the poor around them. We depend on government to do that. And it is our individual jobs to do that. It is our individual blessing to be a part of that. You can have a different kind of savings plan, one that never depreciates, one that never defaults, one that's never plundered by crooks or destroyed by natural calamities. Your treasure will be stored in heaven, and since your treasure is there, you will be too. You will be too. Turn to Kings chapter 3. Two weeks ago, I talked about the difference in members and disciples. Remember I said that Paul said all of Israel walked through the Red Sea and they were all baptized into Moses. But in that group that walked through, there was a mixed multitude that were scared to death about the next plague. They weren't necessarily in love with the God that was leading. Then there was a group of people that were there only because their father was Abraham. And there was finally a smaller group, a much smaller group called disciples that Joshua and Caleb belonged to. You as a church at that time said that you wanted to be disciples, right? That's what you said that day. We as disciples are being taken out behind the barn in these verses that I just read. What you ought to be concerned about has been crowded out by the smallest of things. We focus on what culture tells us is important and we overlook what God has told us is eternally important. In 1 Kings 3, verse 3, Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given to him by his father David. He built a magnificent temple to honor the God of Abraham and his father King David. Now the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there for the that was where the great high place was. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. Notice the next words. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask, what shall I give you? Skipping down to verse 6, and Solomon says, You've shown me great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kingdom for him, and you have given him a son to sit on the throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Your servant is a, your people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant what? an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. Skip to 10. The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said to him, because you have, not, you have asked this thing, have not asked for long life, nor have you asked for riches for yourself, nor asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice Behold, I have done according to your word. See, I've given you a wise and understanding heart. I wish the story of Solomon had ended there. But it didn't. If you'll skip over to 1 Kings 11, the story goes on. Verse 4, When Solomon was old, his wives caused him to follow other gods. So he didn't follow the Lord completely as his father David did. Solomon worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of Sidon, Milcom, the horrible god of the Amorites. Beauty as the culture around us always leads us away from God. Solomon fell in love with beautiful women because of their beautiful clothing and their beautiful cosmetics and their beautiful jewelry. 
a thousand wives. Can you imagine? I have enough love in me for one. I cannot imagine two or even ten, much less a thousand. Culture always leads us away from God. It never leads us to God. And the more we imitate culture, the less likely we are to follow God. Have we lost that horrible teachable spirit that Solomon lost? Have we lost the humility that we were asked to have? Have we decided that the world knows better than God? I'm reading a book by a Catholic um, journalist. And he left his profession and he started doing research into the Catholic Church. And it's interesting, his conclusions. 6.9% of their members give 80% of their offerings. 69 6.9% of their members hold any church office. 6.9% confess that they have a, a scheduled time each day when they pray or when they read the Scriptures. Just 6.9%. I hope the numbers are better than that in this church. I'm not going to do that survey, but if you find yourself short on that, uh, we could use more helpers in the leadership of this church. We could use more help in the offerings of this church. We could use more help in your prayer life for this church. 6.9%. The drifting has delayed the return of Christ. I heard this mentioned in one of the Sabbath school classes. And there's a quote. It says, It was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be thus delayed. She continues to compare the Adventist believers to ancient Israel who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And she says, The same sins of unbelief, worldliness, and lack of consecration and strife had delayed the events of both groups. So as we look at the children of Israel's walk through the desert and we see ten specific challenges to God's leadership, and Moses identified that not as, as challenges against him as a leader, but against God who was leading them. They had a, a cloud that led them and gave them shade by day. They had a, a fiery pillar that protected them at night. And yet they continued to doubt that it was God and they blamed Moses for all their deficiencies in food and water and whatever. This drifting is something that we all need to be careful of. I've played with things that imitated perpetual motion. Are you familiar with that? And these clacking balls, you pull them apart and, you, and they hit together and they go back and forth, back and forth. But eventually, they, their arc is less and less and less. And finally, they don't move anymore. That's what we as Christians have to check ourselves with. Is the Spirit of God still moving us? Are we still being convicted of sin in our life? Had a person today ask me about sin. Is it something we desire to do or is it something that we want to put out of our lives? Is it something we love? Ray Boltz had a song out a number of years ago. It was called a pledge, I Pledge Allegiance to the Lamb. I didn't like Ray Boltz's lifestyle, and I don't necessarily like the fact that he still thinks that that lifestyle is okay, but I love these words. Listen closely. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb with all my strength, with all I am. I will seek to honor His commands. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. The first time I heard this song, tears rolled down my face. I listened to it to the, the other night and I found the same situation. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. With all my strength, with all I am, do I seek to follow His commands? Have I really pledged my allegiance to the Lamb? 
Ephesians 5 verse 10 says, find out what pleases God. In the book of John, there are two short verses. I want you to turn to John chapter 8, verse 29. A disciple is one who follows a teacher and, in, and imitates his teacher. It is not somebody that says, oh, you know, that's a, that's a good idea, that's a good thought, but they, they endeavor to imitate them so John 8, 29 says, And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I what? Always do those things that please him. That is a disciple's mindset. I always do the things that please him. John chapter 3, verse 22, just a few pages back. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are, what? Pleasing in His sight. This is how you already live, so you should do, even it, do it even more. The story is told about a mother who had a hard and fast rule, that, that is, thou shalt not lick the frosting off the cake. Now, I don't know about you, my mother was not a great cook. My father did most of the cooking and almost all of the baking. But he had the same rule. You could lick the beaters. You could lick the bowl after he was finished with it. But you don't lick the frosting off the cake. A well, mother had made a beautiful German chocolate cake. And mother's cakes were always the best. She put just the right things in it. And the aroma of that cake had filled the early morning house. And he just knew mom was icing the cake. He could hear the spatula glide across the surface of that cake, and he knew there would be some left on the beaters and on the, in the bowl. <laughs> but when he got downstairs, his brothers had beat him to it. Mom went out to hang up some clothes on the clothesline, and he thought, well, you know, one little lick won't matter. I mean, right down here at the bottom of the cake, you know, right next to the plate, nobody will notice if I get one little lick of frosting. So he took his little finger, and he reached up there, and he swiped it across the bottom of his cake, and he had it just about here when the door opened, and in walked his mother. And his mother picked him up, took him in the other room and she sat him down and she told him something that doesn't please me. It doesn't please me when you think that you know more than I do. It doesn't please me when I ask you not to do something and you decide to do it. And he said, it about broke my little heart to make my mother unhappy because I chose to take a one finger of frosting off the bottom of the plate hurt my mother. And I decided I would never do that again. Disciples don't mimic the, the way the world talks. I grew up in a rough part of Kansas City. I learned four-letter words before I learned how to spell my name. I had quite a vocabulary. But I noticed at that time that it was only the boys that did the swearing. And they never did it in the presence of girls or ladies. Matter of fact, to do it in front of your parents, in front of a lady or, or your sister, was going to get a sound reprimand. Uh, maybe even a swat on the bottom side. But today we hear girls talking as badly as any of the guys talked in the locker room. And it, and it bothers me. Disciples don't mimic the way the world talks. The Bible says we should learn to talk without using language that is not corrupt, not demeaning, not slanderous, not judging, a person's eternal reward, not filled with malice, without words that are meant to make another person think they're not God's child, not with words meant to ridicule another person or make them feel smaller than you. Even words that sound like swear words or our abbreviations for those words should be eliminated by disciples. I have sat in church and listened to people behind the desk use language that made me shiver. 
um, holy Moses. Moses was not holy. Jesus said only one was holy, and that was his father. When I was in the hospital the first time, with um, I was in there five weeks and two days or something like that. Man walked in. He called himself Father. I said, "I have one father." And he was the father who helped give birth to me. I have another father. He's in heaven. I don't think you qualify as either. And he turned around and left the room. Disciples want to please God in what they eat. And so they look to see what the creator of humanity decided was best for us to eat. And society says that Alcoholic beverages are okay and they're good. Caffeinated beverages are good. But your body was made to use water. And I'm amazed when you look at it. Water regulates the body's temperature. It moistens the tissues in your eyes, nose, and mouth. It even dilutes the mucus that runs down your throat as you age. It protects the body's organs and tissues. It carries nutrients and oxygen to every cell in your body. It lubricates your joints. It lessens the burden on your kidneys and liver by flushing out waste products and it dissolves minerals and nutrients so they're usable by your body. Many people get up in the morning think they need one or two or three cups of coffee and in order to get started, what they really needed was three or four glasses of room temperature water. It will get you started just as easy and it will last longer. Coffee and tea and caffeinated beverages have the result of making us dehydrated and making our bodies work differently than they were intended. Disciples don't use tobacco in any of its forms. Those are the things that the pastor said last week when you were baptized, right? That's exactly what he said. Disciples know that the world is defining our beauty and our personal worth. If you, don't, if you can't afford, if you don't do, uh, I'm amazed at cell phone technology. I cannot spend $1,200 on a cell phone. I just cannot. Uh, it, it just bothers me. I have friends and neighbors that need food, that struggle paying their rent or their utilities. I, I can give a lot more to them than I can give to a cell phone company for a cell phone. I have a cell phone and it's three years past date. But society says every year you need a new one and you need a top of the line one. To stay beautiful in this world's eyes, we're constantly having to buy new products. If you don't use this toothpaste, your teeth are not really clean. If you don't use this deodorant, you stink. If you don't wear these clothes, you're out of fashion. And they bring up these, these models. I worked my first job full-time was in a catalog department. I can tell you what you see in print is not what is reality. We could literally make a 180-pound person look like they were 120. We could take somebody who, was, who had ugly scars and remove those scars, and you, you would think they were absolutely gorgeous. What you see in print is not what is reality. So don't try, worry about imitating it. The fashion business worldwide is a $171 billion business. The cosmetic business in the United States is a $14.8 billion business. We, for a short while, worked with Amway. And I was intrigued as these ladies would come in and they would bring their existing cosmetics and they would have drawers. Drawers full of them. And they were being told that those were no good. That they had to buy these. And in a few years, they would be told those were no good. They would have to buy these. And yet there were drawers of these products that were sitting in their house. Umpteen thousands of dollars worth of cosmetics gathering dust and the money wasted. You were created by God to be uniquely different than anyone else. You do not ever have to look like any of the fashion models, male or female. Arnold Schwarzenegger at his highest, he doesn't look anything like that today, right? Cheryl Teague at, her, at the top of her line, she doesn't look anything like that today. 
Beauty even in the world vanishes. It slowly erodes. Don't waste your time or your money trying to look like the world. You are a jewel. God created you as one. You are of inestimable worth. Your value is beyond comprehension. You don't have to add to it to make yourself more beautiful. God has a special place for you in eternity. And while you may have a twin even, that twin will not have the same nose print or ear print as you. You are unique. God created you for His plan, not for the world's plan. As we read earlier, Solomon in all of his glory didn't hold a candle to the lilies of the field. But I want you to look at a text that's familiar to all Adventists, and yet I'm not sure that all Adventists have seen what I'm going to show you. Look at Ezekiel chapter 28. I've spent a little time looking at commentaries, and there's a wide assortment of ideas, but from the ideas that I've seen, I'm convinced that the biggest part of this description is talking about Lucifer himself, because Lucifer was in the Garden of Eden. Lucifer was the covering cherub. So this message is about Lucifer. Starting in verse 13 of Ezekiel 28, we read, You were in Eden, the Garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, the emerald, with gold, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes. That's the apparatus that allows you to sing. Was prepared for you on the day that you were created. Skip down to verse 17. Your heart was lifted up because of what? Because of what? What was his beauty? What did he see as his beauty? He saw his beauty as this beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald with gold. That was what he saw his beauty, and God wanted him to see who he was, was beautiful. You can never attach anything to yourself that make yourself look better than what God has planned for you. But the world wants you to, and the world profits from it. And we know the rest of that story. Lucifer will eventually be cast to the ground. He will be destroyed, root and branch. Everything, and those who have fallen in love, what he did. As I was reading the story in the Garden of Eden, there was one thing that, that jumped out at me, and that is this. Lucifer's main thrust was God is not enough for you. God is not enough for you. He hasn't given you everything you need. He hasn't given everything that you should have. And that is the same message the world around us is saying today. God is not enough. And I want to tell you, God is more than enough. If He so cared for the lilies, that they are so beautiful that Solomon and all of his gorgeous robes never equaled them, if he so cared for the birds that the food that he supplies for them was sufficient, then the food that God has provided for us is sufficient, right? Amen. We don't have to go to the diet of the world. More and more cardiologists and cancer doctors are saying that the message that Ellen White gave in Councils on Food is the best diet for you and I. Back to Eden was the title of a book. Now, some of us can't eat that diet. My body will, will almost destroy itself if I try to eat a bunch of raw fruit. We have a gentleman in this church that's being called Mr. Salad, or Salad Man. And he brings the most beautiful salads to fellowship lunch. But if I ate a bowl of his salad, I would be sick this afternoon. Almost within 30 minutes, I would be sick. My body doesn't digest it. And it, I get in trouble. So I have to eat my vegetables slightly cooked. If that's what you have to do, but staying as close to that diet as possible will give you the best health that's possible for you. You don't have to eat the world's diet. Last week, Pastor Tom said, we are at risk of our own eternity 
when we ignore or fail to use all that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit inspired His spokespersons to write down for us. I said, Amen. We are at risk of our own eternity when we ignore or fail to use all that the, the Holy Spirit inspired His spokespersons to write down for us. We are held accountable for what we could have known. Uh, I remember my children saying something that my wife had said er years earlier when she was a child, and that is, if I don't know about it, then I can't be judged for it. I didn't see that speed limit sign, but the cop gave me a ticket anyway because the sign was there. No? He said it was 45. Well, I didn't see the sign. I went back up the road, and yeah, it was there, but there was a branch across it. You are held accountable for what you could have known. We all have hours. I was talking with my father-in-law one day as we were riding along together to a sale. And I said, you know, I just don't have time. He said, what do you mean you don't have time? And he was talking about the good old days. I mean, the days before I was born. The days when before television was prevalent. The days when radio was the only source of entertainment that they had. And the days before that, where he and his parents lived was just 20 miles from the last Indian raid in Kansas. 20 miles. And it took them a year to find out that it had happened. We went to the Santa Fe Trail ride one day, and then the lady was telling us that an Indian raid attacked a wagon train. And as they were murdering the white settlers, and I'm not going to get into whether it was right or wrong. That's not the point of this illustration. A mother and her daughter crept through the grass that was about this tall and marched themselves into the community 10 miles away. And the people got on their horses and they rode out to help the people, but there wasn't anybody left alive. Society has changed. And I said, Dad, what did you do with all your time? And he said, well, we had barn raisings. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, uh, a farmer would move into the area and he needed a barn. He said, we would all get together as a group of farmers and we would help put up a, a barn for him. We had quilting. I have in my home a quilt that Barbara's mother and father made in the very early years of their marriage. We don't have time to quilt anymore. I marvel at my wife. She sits there and, and without looking, she takes a piece of of yarn and she starts with either two needles or one hook putting together something that is absolutely gorgeous when she's done but in the time that I'm reading something or in the time that I'm watching something on the television she has made something of practical use for somebody that she loves somebody that needs a little encouragement we all have the time to read by the way, if you have a smartphone, and mine's not on because I don't want it up here, but if you have a smartphone, you can simply go to your Play Store if you're an Android, and I don't know what the iPhone app is, and you can put E.G. White Writings 2 in, and all of Ellen White's books will come up on your phone. So when you're sitting at the doctor's office waiting that hour or two, you know, for the appointment that was 30 minutes ago, you can sit there and you can read something that would be beneficial to you. Some of those books are available so that you can hear them. So while you're driving to see your family members or, or even to church, we drive an hour to church. Every week it takes us right at an hour. If the stoplights are wrong, Joe, it takes us an hour and ten minutes. We have 17 stoplights that we go through. But in that time, you can listen to an awful lot of information that will help you grow in your Christian life. It is, these are quotes from Ellen White that I'm going to read. And I'm not going to give you all of the page numbers and things because I want you to start looking. You need to start reading for yourself. You need to start finding out the information for yourself. You cannot depend on the person here. I believe David is right. The Lord is coming soon. And 
before that happens, the people that are behind this desk will all be arrested or killed. Your faith has to be in what you know. It cannot be on what the speaker behind this desk believes. It cannot be on the speaker that is in front of your Sabbath school class. You have to know yourself. Amen. You have to. It is God who condescends to give these instructions that are the declarations of infinite wisdom. And those who disregard them so do at their own peril and loss. All that we urge is compliance with the instruction injunctions of God's words. Those conscientious to wear jewelry are regarded as narrow-minded, superstitious, even fanatical. Avoidance of costly arraignment. Mrs. White posits that Christians are not to decorate themselves with costly array or ornaments. She maintains that to dress plainly and abstain from the display of jewelry and ornaments of every kind is in keeping with our faith. Now hang on, because I want to read you from the Word of God that that's true. That last quote is Evangelism 2.69. There is an ornament that will never perish. I want it. There's an ornament that will never perish. I need it. There's an ornament that will never perish. I deserve it. I'm His child. I need it. I deserve it. It's mine. That will promote the happiness of all around us in this life and will shine with undimmed luster in the immortal future. It is the adorning, ready? It is the adorning of a meek and lowly spirit. It is the spirit that Solomon had when he asked for wisdom, and it is the spirit Solomon lost when his wives influenced him to dress and live like the culture around him. Some have a burden of regarding the wearing of a marriage ring, feeling that the wives of our ministers should conform to this custom. All of this is unnecessary. Let ministers' wives have the golden link which binds their souls to Jesus, a pure and holy character, the true love and meekness and godliness that are born upon a Christian tree, and their influence will be secure anywhere. I've worked almost 40 years going door to door in homes. And many times I was with a lady by herself. I've worked going door to door in businesses and many times with a lady by herself. And I've never wore a wedding ring. And I've never been asked if you're married. Never have. And the reason is that somewhere in the pre-conversation my love for my wife comes up and I'm happy that I have spent my whole adult life with one woman. We have a first cousin that introduces his wife this way. I'm happy to introduce you to my first wife. But it's also his second, third, fourth, fifth wife. He's been married to her one year longer than Barb and I have been married. We need not to wear the sign, for we are true to our marriage vow, and the wearing of a ring is no evidence. And if you doubt that, sit in a group of salespeople sometime. When they go out on the prowl, do you know what they look for? The wedding ring. They figure they've had fewer sexual partners. Thus, they don't have to spend as much time worrying about if they've contracted some kind of disease. The wedding ring is no sign of your fidelity. I feel deeply over this leavening process which is going on among us into the conformity to custom and fashion. Not one penny should be spent on a circle of gold to testify that we are married. In countries where this is imperative, we have no burden to condemn those who have the marriage ring. I'm not going to read to you. She had a daughter-in-law, future daughter-in-law at the time, that came to her and asked her about the wedding ring. And she said, if you can conscientiously wear it, wear it. And the girl was married to Ellen White's son with a wedding ring. But in just a year or two, she pulled the ring off and she said, I can't conscientiously wear this. Turn to Revelation 17. 
and I was worried about letting you out on time, I think you'll be fine. In the book of Revelation, we see two women. And a woman in Revelation represents... A woman in Revelation represents a... You all ought to be saying it. And if you haven't, if you didn't know it, you ought to be at more evangelistic meetings. A woman in Revelation represents a church. We're going to look at two churches. Revelation 17, verse 4 and 5. The woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written. Who was she? Mystery, Babylon the Great the mother of harlots, the abomination of the earth. Pretty clear who that lady is, isn't it? Pretty clear who, who belongs to that church, too. How many of you ever heard the thing, birds of a feather flock together? Only a couple of people? I thought everybody heard that. My grandmother told me that as a child. Birds of a feather flock together. People who like the same kind of music usually gather together to sing and dance that same music, right? People that like to drink a certain beverage, they gather together at the same place night after night, day after day, week after week, year after year to drink the same thing. And the story is told about an old man who had gotten to the place in his life where driving was difficult for him. He missed the driveway to his own home four times. His son said, okay, Dad, you're, you're going to have to quit driving. And he said, well, I get down the road just fine. And he says, Dad, you have missed the driveway to your own house four times. So he took the keys to the car and he sold the car. He came back to visit his father and the father wasn't home. So he looked through the barn, looked through all the outbuildings. He couldn't find him, hollered and hollered. He couldn't find him. Finally, he got to looking around, and he noticed the tractor was missing. So he drove down the road, got to town, went to the coffee shop where his father went every day at 4 o'clock. And there was father at 4 o'clock at the coffee shop with his old friends drinking a cup of coffee. And he said, Dad, how did you get here? Well, I drove the tractor. He said, what am I going to do with you, Dad? So he sold the tractor. A couple of weeks later, he's back to find his father, and he can't find his father. He looks through all the same buildings. He looks through, and he can't find him, so he goes back to the coffee shop. There's Dad, sitting at the table drinking coffee with his friends. Dad, how did you get here? Well, I drove the lawnmower. <laughs> so he sold the lawnmower. And his father said, now how am I going to visit with my friends? So they put him in a nursing center, and he was the life of the party. He got to dance with more women than he'd ever thought was possible. He made new friends, got to drink coffee at 4 o'clock with his friends, got to play dominoes. But the point of the story is his friends were what was important to him. Are you as faithful being here Sabbath morning? Pastor Tom and I have an adage, if there's five drops of rain, attendance will be down by 50%. If it's communion Sabbath, attendance will be down 50%. And it's tragic. When I fell in love with the farmer's daughter, we started church at 10 o'clock. Jerry, that would have made you happy. But that was so that we could get all the cattle fed and all the fences checked and back to town and showered and bathed and cleaned up and ready to go to church. Had no inside plumbing, but nobody missed. Everybody was there even after delivering a calf that was coming backwards. You got to church on time because it was important. All of your friends were there. You are my family. When you miss, I miss you. I was visiting with one of our church members and she said, watching church on the screen is, is no substitute for the hugs that I get when I come to church. Another lady said, we thought this church would be like so many other churches we've been at, but this church is different. You make it different. You love each other. So 
encourage those that are with you. Now, Revelation does a little bit different story. In Revelation 12, just a few pages back, it tells the story of another woman. It's a woman who's a disciple of Jesus. It's a woman that represents you and I, or is supposed to represent you and I. Revelation 12, verse 1, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon, and under her feet and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Notice the simplicity. Notice the brightness, the natural beauty of this woman as compared with the lavish ornamentation of the woman from Babylon. James tells us that faith without works is dead. Please, please, please don't get caught up in the legalism. We are saved by grace, Amen. not by works, lest any one of us should boast. Because we've been granted grace, we do good works. Because we've been given grace, we are gracious to other people. Because we have been sinners, we're kind to people that are sinners. By the way, the Bible says we're all sinners, right? All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. It is our responsibility to love as we've been loved. Works that guide others to Jesus are the works that God values. Works that do not pose a stumbling block to others. There is nothing that I've seen in my 50 years as a Seventh-day Adventist that causes stumbling and falling out of the church more seriously, more consistently than that of ornamentation and clothing. We have studied with people, they've seen the Word, they've believed the Word, they have pledged allegiance to the Word, and then they come to church and they find other people dressed as they used to dress, ornamented as they used to wear. And they say, what else is the church teaching that's wrong? We have the privilege of being a stepping stone or a stumbling block. And I want to tell you, as I've aged, some stepping stones are now stumbling blocks. I appreciate stairs that are a little bit shorter. Those stairs that are a little bit taller, sometimes I get my toes caught on. I get embarrassed when I fall on my face. I don't know about you, but you know, brothers and sisters, that happens with new people in our church. They get embarrassed when they come to church and they think the church stands for and then they see the church drinking coffee or they see the church dressing in a way that the, they used to teach and wear. They get embarrassed. And when they get embarrassed, they quit coming. This week I saw something that I'm going to close with, but I want you to think seriously about it. We can't put words in God's mouth. We can't put words in God's mouth. In other words, if God says something is wrong, we can't say it's right. The Bible isn't a suggestion book, neither is the spirit of prophecy. God knows exactly what He's doing to prepare a people to live eternally with Him. If I were moving to France, I'd want to dress like the people in France, right? I'd want to talk French, right? I'm on my way to heaven. It's time that I clean up my language. It's time that I eat like I'm going to eat in heaven. It's time that I let God be everything in my life instead of me being everything in my life. God has control of my day and my night, of my words, of my actions. And know this, if I send something to you that hurts your feelings, come talk to me. I would never intentionally say anything to hurt any of you. And I may not have meant it the way that you thought I did. Years and years and years ago, we were at a church service and the man said, I want to do something. I want you to take a sheet of paper and I want you to write down the first word that comes to your mind. I'm going to give you one word and you write down the first word that comes to your mind. And the word he gave us was tree. 
tree. Now, there's 45 people in the church. Do you know that there were about 40 different answers? There were mulberry trees and cottonwood trees and oak trees and pine trees and tree houses. There wasn't a single palm tree in the church that day because this was in the heart of Kansas. <laughs> and we don't have palm trees in Kansas. And that was his point. You can't build a tree house in a palm tree. So we let, allow God to work through us to use His words to help people find Him. That's why I can't talk to the people that are David's friends or Sue Ann's friends or Ken's friends. You have a unique relationship with those people that I can't duplicate. And you are their stepping stone to Jesus or you're their stumbling block. And we're all disciples. Disciples of Jesus or disciples of Satan. And we are known by the company we keep. Keep company with God and His angels. Amen. Keep company with them. And He will show you what's wrong and how to correct it. Amen. God bless you. In closing, I'd like for you to turn to 554. Well, let me walk with thee. My song leaders are waiting. Please stand for our closing hymn, number 554. Oh, let me walk with thee. We pledge allegiance to the Lamb. We wish for Him to lead us day by day in the way we speak, in what we eat, and how we dress, and how we love. May the grace that You have given us be given to others through us. And may they know us by that love. And may they long to spend eternity with You. That is our prayer in Your Son's name. Amen. Amen.